ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, please, uh, please find your seats. Uh, before we get started with uh, today's event, uh, I just want to put in a plug for Stephen Ergola and the, uh, uh, the, the archives. They're looking for work study uh, students, so if this is something that sounds interesting to any of you students who are here, uh, interested in uh, working in the archives, in the uh, rare books, and special collections library, uh, please see Stephen sitting in the back and raising his hand. <laughs> um, and that would be great. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Noha Alan Gowdy, the Dean of Gap, John Malloy, the Dean of Huss, who's sitting here with us. And Pascal Mazzale, the chair of the ABC History Department, it is my privilege to welcome you to this first event of the new academic year of the Center for American Studies and Research, also known as CASAR. I am the director of CASAR and an assistant professor of African and world history, and my name is Mark Leeds. I am fortunate to have the dedicated assistance of Yasmin al There's Yasmin. Today is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Mike Reimer, to give our first CASAR talk of the year. I think I speak for all of my colleagues in the history department when I say that we all love and respect Mike. He hasn't gotten the message yet that he is a tenured full professor and that he doesn't have to work this hard. <laughs> uh, but he does, because that's who he is. He is a consummate professional historian. Mike Reimer is married to Marty Reimer, and they have three children and four grandchildren. He has taught history at AUC since 1990, the year I graduated from the day. He is currently teaching courses on U.S. relations with the countries of the Middle East, state and society in the modern era world, the history of Zionism in the era of Israeli conflict, and the quest of the historical Jesus. His most recent book is The First Zionist Congress, an annotated translation of the proceedings, published in 2019 by the State University of New York Press. Mike has a bachelor's degree from Pepperdine University and an MA and PhD from Georgetown. Please join me in welcoming Mike Reimer to the book. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. And thank you all for coming. Uh, oops, I just lost my screen. All right. Um, I, uh, I want to say at the outset that in, in one way, uh, this is just a glorified book report. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I stole the title of the talk from a book that was published actually in 1991 by Gary Sick entitled October Surprise. Uh, and uh, I really got fascinated by the, the uh, book. And uh, the reason that it's uh, very timely, oops. Uh, is that uh, in March of uh, uh, this past year, well, this year, March of this year, 2023, uh, a very interesting article appeared in the New York Times uh, with the title, A Four Decade Secret One Man's Story of Sabotaging Carter's Reelection. Right? And the subtitle was A Prominent Texas Politician said he unwittingly took part in the 1980 tour of the Middle East with a clandestine agenda. Uh, maybe he uh, added unwittingly because he was afraid of uh, the legal implications of admitting that he knew what was going on. Uh, but uh, it made me, it intrigued me. And uh, I have a class that is uh, focused on America in the Middle East. Here. And uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, we talked about it in class and it made me think that it would be uh, an interesting topic for a wider audience as well. Right? So I'll come to this uh, uh, article again in a little bit, but uh, it is important to uh, relate these two events to one another. Uh, what was going on in Iran, and in particular the takeover of the uh, American embassy and the holding of American hostages in Iran throughout 1980, uh, and Jimmy Carter's defeat uh, on the 4th of November in uh, 1980. Uh, he was, his uh, the challenger was Ronald Reagan, and the uh, Reagan camp, Reagan, Reagan won by a landslide, it was a huge, uh, but uh, so people probably didn't look into this partly because Reagan's you know victory was so overwhelming. Uh, it seemed like you know it was a, almost a foregone conclusion. But the reality is actually quite different. And so what I'm going to present to you is some evidence that shows that things might have turned out very very differently. So anyway, uh, October surprise is a reference to. Uh, the fact that American elections are held in November, and if you can pull off an October surprise, it means that you may win uh, where you were expected to lose. So that's really what uh, we're talking about here. Okay. Um, now, in our, our course on America in the Middle East, uh, we're uh, you know we're talking about a, a, a bi-directional kind of influence, okay? There's a common tendency to think of the U.S. as uh, the agent or cause of events taking place in the Middle East. While the Middle East is the patient or an area that's acted upon. And what I want to argue today in this talk is that that's a, a grossly oversimplified way of thinking about who's influencing whom, okay? Now, there certainly are some events uh, that have taken place in the Middle East and uh, the example I'm going to give is directly relevant to uh, you know, the events that I'll be discussing because it took place in Iran. Um, some of you at least will be aware that Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi was reinstalled as an autocratic ruler in Iran in 1953 after a coup d'etat against the Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. Uh, which was organized by the CIA and MI6, the uh, British equivalent of the CIA, uh, led to a subject's downfall. Okay. Now, even that was simplified because there was controversy about the subject's uh, position and where he wanted to take Iran inside Iran. But there is also plenty of evidence, uh, and in fact, memoirs of people who uh, were in the CIA at the time who uh, talk about uh, their organizing riots uh, against Mossadegh, uh, which helped to bring the Shah back to power in 1953. So without spending a lot of time, there's an obvious example of the US influencing events uh, in the region. However, influences are almost always flowing in both directions, and sometimes events in the Middle East can have a decisive impact on what happens in the US, right? as in the case of the 1980 presidential election. All right, and so to understand how Iran or events in Iran influenced that election, I'm summarizing here very, very quickly a whole lot of things that happened in Iran from the time that the Shah was brought back to power in 1953 until the outbreak of a revolution against him in 1978. Okay, um, so during that time, the Shah, in order to reestablish his control over the country, set up an infamous intelligence organization called SADC. Right? Something about even the way you say that word. It sounds sinister, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, okay, well it was. <laughs> uh, he accepted a lot of American financial aid, especially in the 1950s, uh, and U.S. advisors in various departments of government. Uh, he became a founding member of OPEC, uh, where he was uh, known as a price hawk, somebody who uh, wanted to see prices increased. Uh, he was quite aggressive in that regard. Uh, the third, or the, the, the thing that has a triple star here is, is uh, probably the most important. He embarked on major reforms to redistribute land ownership in Iran, uh, 
uh, promote literacy, build infrastructure, uh, pursue the westernization or secularization of Iranian society, and not incidentally, purchased massive quantities of arms, especially from the United States, although he was quite capable of buying arms from other countries as well. Okay. Um, the result of all this was that the Shah was perceived within Iran as an American puppet, uh, which was really a distortion, although it's an understandable one. I mean, he was brought back to power by the United States, and the United States did give him a great deal of help in the 50s and 60s, and he was buying huge amounts of American arms, so wasn't he a puppet? All right. And if, if you're interested, we can talk about this more in, in Q&A afterwards. All right. Well, I, I chose this image because it makes him look like a puppet, right? I mean, he's there, but America is behind him, right? The flag of the United States is there. Okay. Um, another thing that happened, okay, especially in the 1970s, okay, the, the Shaw had this alliance with the United States beginning in the 50s down to the 70s, okay? But in uh, the 70s, several, several changes took place that are very important for understanding uh, his, well, what I call the oil-induced megalomania, okay? Thinking big, thinking that he could transform Iran in a very short time into really a major power, right? Uh, okay, uh, there was a visit to Iran uh, by uh, President Richard Nixon and uh, his uh, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger in May of 1972. And uh, one of the things that's really astonishing is during this visit, uh, according to Gary Sick, again, the, the author of this uh, book that I've, I've mentioned before, uh, Nixon looked across the table at the Shaw and said, Protect me. Now, that's an incredible statement for the President of the United States to make to the king of a third world developing country, right? Uh, so, what did he mean by that? Well, uh, Sick explains this in, in several different places and, and suggests that uh, at this point in time, the United States had not yet extricated itself from Vietnam. And, uh, and uh, Nixon really, in the Middle East, felt as though he needed uh, the protection of, that the Shaw could provide, because the Shaw was buying arms, as I said, by this time, okay, and establishing himself as a dominant or the dominant regional power, the dominant power in the world. Okay, that's why I use the term here. Was he a U.S. proxy or a U.S. partner? The Shaw certainly thought of himself as a partner, not a proxy. The Shah was, uh, in exchange for this protection he was going to offer the United States, was free to purchase U.S. arms, uh, and he used uh, money from the oil revenues, the oil boom that started in 1973, to buy arms and also to lead uh, what he saw as a march towards Iran's great civilization, okay? and which included all of the reforms that I've, I've mentioned earlier. Right. Um, I just included this because Henry Kissinger was very influential, of course, uh, under both Nixon and then his successor, Gerald Ford. And Henry Kissinger's view of the Shaw was that he was a tough, mean guy, but our real friend, the only one who could stand up to the Soviet Union. And so he was a, an integral part of America's uh, confrontation with the Soviet Union, uh, and in particular, the Middle East. Okay. But, uh, Iran did not remain stable, okay? And in 1978, we have the uh, uh, an explosion of protest uh, against the Shah. Again, I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, but the Shah was vulnerable within Iran because uh, of the political repression, uh, resentment against programs of modernization, corruption, the establishment of uh, the Rastafari party, Again, we can talk about that in Q&A if you're interested. There was a sudden drop in oil revenues in 1977. It wasn't sustained, but there was uh, some a fall in revenues, which meant the government had to make some cuts in welfare programs and things like this. Um, but most important for our purposes uh, was the election of Jimmy Carter in 1976. 
And Carter's open advocacy of, a, of human rights as an important part of America's foreign policy. Okay. The Shoal also made a, a very, uh, in retrospect, colossal error in uh, uh, publishing in one of the government newspapers a, uh, a diatribe against Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and that set in motion at the beginning of 1978 the clergy led revolution. Now, uh, what were Iranian views of Jimmy Carter? Well, they were mixed. Okay? Uh, some intellectuals in uh, Iran were very hopeful in 1977, after Carter was inaugurated, uh, that he would pursue a policy of advocating human rights and pushing the Shah towards the liberalization of his regime uh, in 77 78. Uh, but when Carter visited Iran on the 31st of December, 1977, he said something that I'm sure he regrets until his dying day. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. Okay. This was on the eve of uh, you know, a revolution. Right? Uh, and so to many Iranians, Carter appeared to be a complete hypocrite advocating human rights, but then absolving the Shah of his brutal repression, right? Um, all right, and there, there he is making his speech, uh, very famous photo, and toasting the Shah on New Year's Eve. Right? Okay, um, now the Shah, uh, I, I'm obviously condensing or compressing a great deal of what happened here, okay? Uh, the Shah, after a year of protests and demonstrations, decided to leave in January of 1979. And uh, a couple of weeks after the Shah left, on the 1st of February 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran after about 15 years in exile. Right? Uh, his goal was to set up an independent Islamic Republic, but, and this is sometimes missed, uh, there were multiple political forces in Iran pulling in different directions, and no one could say really at the beginning of 1979 what direction Iran would move. Right? Uh, now, later in 79, in October, the United States made a decision, well, the Carter administration made a decision to admit the Shah, who was sick, he was dying of cancer, for medical treatment to the United States. Uh, he was admitted to uh, New York Hospital. And this led student militants to plan and then uh, carry out a takeover of the U.S. Embassy on the 4th of November, 1979. Okay. Uh, this contributed to a radicalization of the regime. In other words, it, it sort of reinforced uh, Khomeini's supremacy within the country. Right. Okay, so there's Khomeini coming back on an Air France flight uh, that was specially chartered for him and for a group of reporters who came with him and of course other Iranian exiles, and uh, it was being received in Tehran in February of 1979. And uh, then later in 79, you have some photographs here of uh, the takeover of the embassy, uh, a crowd surrounding the embassy on the 4th of November, people started climbing in. Uh, many of you have seen the movie Argo, I think they, they, they tried to take this as well, you see the embassy compound being uh, taken over by uh, this uh, demonstrating crowd, and of course there were uh, plenty of uh, American flags to burn after uh, the embassy was taken over. In fact, uh, one person who was, uh, uh, you know, American reporter who, who visited the demonstrations that were taking place outside the embassy in subsequent days said that it was one of the, you know, if you wanted to make money, one, one way to do that was to, uh, well, of course you could sell, you know, various kinds of foodstuffs because there were lots of people standing around and they wanted to buy food and drink. But another 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 real money maker was that you could sell various flags to burn. <laughs> All right, and there are uh, embassy employees who've been taken hostage. Um, there were uh, uh, the numbers that you'll see for the number of uh, employees who were captured varies a little bit over time. Ultimately, uh, there were 52 people who were held for over a, uh, over a, a year 
444 days. Uh, some were held for a shorter period of time and then released, but we, don't, we won't go into all the details of their ordeal right now. Okay. Uh, now, when the, the takeover took place, there was a, there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> debate over what would actually happen. Okay. So let me back this up. Okay. You'll see the uh, New York Times on the 5th of November uh, read an article, j Ron students seize U.S. Embassy and hold hostages, and, and then down below it says, and they want the approval of Ayatollah Khomeini. Okay. So, I mean, is, is, isn't that enough? Well, it's not exact, okay? Because in the same newspaper, we have a report that the government of Iran, government of Iran, is vowing to help resolve the takeover of the embassy, okay? Well, is it Ayatollah Khomeini, the government of Iran? So, the situation is very confused at this point, okay? Uh, what happened is that, yes, in a way, the Ayatollah was running a kind of shadow government of clergy, right? Uh, and he gave approval for what the students had done, right? But there was also a prime minister and a foreign minister that he had a, he had approved of earlier in 1979, who were now working to resolve this situation, okay? In other words, they were in disagreement with the Ayatollah's radical decision to, you know, uh, continue the takeover of the, of the embassy, right? And they were in favor of, uh, of a negotiated solution to this uh, crisis and with uh, reestablishing uh, more friendly ties with the United States. Okay, so the situation is very confused and people, and the New York Times says, uh, it's not clear who's in charge in Iraq, okay? All right, so uh, after the embassy was taken over, actually the prime minister, because of his failure to be able to convince Khomeini that this needed to be resolved, uh, Prime Minister uh, Mahdi Bazargan resigned. The Americans were now held hostage, and the, their fate was an open question, okay? And so the hostage issue remains unresolved, and going into 1980, it's on the news every day, okay? Uh, ABC actually created a program, a late night program, uh, which I think was called America Help Austria. Okay? It was a report about what was going on uh, in Iran every day. Right? And Walter Cronkite, who is easily the most popular American journalist, TV journalist, would end every uh, night's TV uh, news program with a statement of how many days Americans had held, had been held hostage in Iran. Right? Uh, so it never left the news. It was always there. Okay. Um, and at first, that worked to Carter's advantage because people were sympathetic uh, for, for his attempts to uh, get the hostages released. But uh, over time, there was increasing frustration and impatience and a feeling that uh, you know, he was weak, and if he, you know, he used America's strength, uh, you know, the hostages would have been released. Actually, most hostages agreed that if he used strength, i.e. military power, they probably would, would have all been executed. Okay. Um, now, at the same time, in 1980, uh, Carter's running for election uh, against, or re-election, I should say, against Ronald Reagan. Right? Uh, former governor of California. Reagan strategists realized that the hostage issue was a wild card in the election, and that what happened with hostages was going to have a very big influence on the outcome. Okay? Uh, and they knew that if Carter won the release, especially you know, if he pulled off an October surprise, then he might be able to swing the electorate to his side. This was a this is a quote from uh, Gary Six book, where he says that Michael Deaver was very prominent in the Reagan campaign. He said, One of the things we concluded early was that a Reagan victory would be nearly impossible if the hostages were released before the election. No doubt in my mind that the euphoria of the hostage release would have rolled over the land like a tidal So he was sure that this was going to win the election for Carter. Okay. 
Okay? Uh, and there's Carter, and there's the Ayatollah, and they're facing off with each other here. <laughs> so, who was going to win? In a way, right? uh, by the way, it does remind me, just to digress for a second, that uh, the, um, well, the first time that my wife and I came to uh, Egypt was in uh, 1982. And uh, I just remember how popular Jimmy Carter was. And wherever we moved, everywhere we went, people would smile, and we, you know, we, didn't, we identified ourselves quite freely as Americans, and they would say, Jimmy Carter, number one. <laughs> 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 uh, so it's just interesting, you know, that he was, because he wasn't as popular in the United States, obviously, but I mean, you had the impression that if you run for president of Egypt, you would have won. <laughs> anyway, okay. Now, the question that arises here, did Khomeini keep the hostages in, in order to humiliate Carter? Um, I think he did, okay. Uh, and at the time, the prolongation of the hostage crisis uh, seems as though it was ex explicable, it could be explained, right, uh, very plausibly for this, you know, or the basis of this intense hatred that Khomeini had for Carter, okay? But then, over time, evidence began to build up that war was happening below the surface, and that Iran's refusal to make a deal to recalcitrance had other causes. Okay, and here we come to uh, Gary Six, 1991 book, October Surprise. Okay, now Sig worked for Carter. Very important to know this. Okay, um, he was on the National Security Council, right? Um, and uh, he didn't believe in uh, the, the suggestions that had already come to the surface. Right? The, the hostages, by the way, were released five minutes after Reagan was inaugurated on the 20th of January, 1981, okay? And you're all familiar with the term post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? Our philosophers are, I know. After this, therefore, because of this, okay? And so some people, fell into this fallacy, okay, and said, well, it mu there must be a connection. There must be a connection between uh, the fact that, you know, Reagan's inaugurated and then the hostages are released, okay? Um, Sid was not one of those. He dismissed this idea. He thought, as I just suggested a minute ago, that uh, he had a sufficient explanation for the crisis being prolonged. And that was, again, to teach Carter a lesson. Know, to really drive home the, uh, you know, Iran's disappointment, anger, frustration, and feeling of betrayal um, uh, by President Carter. Okay? But as time went on, uh, he began to collect evidence uh, that he put into this book uh, about the hostages and the election of Ronald Reagan. Okay. Um, I pause here for a moment to just reflect on the fact that history is not static. It's not a deposit of information that we collect and then put in our brains and it doesn't change, okay? Critical historiography is always open to new evidence and six evidence after reading this book I think is powerful. It's not merely circumstantial, not just based on the fact that there was this you know, the release of the hostages after uh, Reagan was inaugurated. I think his evidence was actually underestimated. But it was dismissed by congressional investigation was a you know a congressional committee that looked into some of this. Okay. Now they missed a crucially important document. Okay. Uh, an important question throughout their inquiry was where was William Casey, Reagan's campaign manager? Okay. Sick had argued Casey met Matthew Karubi, uh, an envoy of Iran's clerical party in Iran in Madrid in July of 1980. Um, they could find no evidence that uh, Casey was actually in Madrid, and this was a very important part of the case against Reagan's campaign being in touch with Iranians, okay? Well, it turns out, after they completed their study, the State Department released a document showing that Casey was indeed in Madrid at the time, indicated by six evidence. Uh, in fact, the ambassador, uh, of the United States ambassador to Spain, had uh, noted in his diary that uh, Casey was in Madrid for purposes unknown. Okay. 
so, uh, you know, again, it's uh, how history evolves as evidence comes to light. There's William Casey. And after Reagan was elected, he was uh, appointed the director of the CIA. Okay. Uh, now, the, the story about Casey establishing secret contact with the Iranian regime, you know, we have to ask the question, is that plausible? Could that really have happened during an election? I mean, could this have been taking place and nobody knew about it? Okay. Well, yes, it could. Okay. Casey was in the OSS in World War II, which was the Office of uh, Strategic Services, if I recall correctly. It was the predecessor of the CIA. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was appointed director of the CIA. And his behavior during 1980 is consistent with the testimony of people who knew him well that he loved covert operations. Uh, it's also uh, consistent with the testimony that Casey, again, Reagan's campaign manager, was obsessed by the possibility of an October surprise being pulled off by the Carter administration with the release of the hostages. Okay? So we have a man who likes covert operations and thinks about them as the solution to problems. Okay? Uh, all right. Now, why would Iran cooperate, even if we grant that there was an interest on the part of the Reagan campaign in uh, preventing Carter from exploiting an October surprise? Why would Iran uh, want into this? And in addition, the Israelis got involved as well. Okay, uh, the Israelis, and I'll, so I'll try to explain why Iran and Israel both got into this deal. Right? What was their you know, what was the benefit that they hoped to uh, attain? Right? Iran needed money and it needed arms. Okay, uh, when one of the one of the things that Carter did once the hostages were uh, uh, you know taken and uh, and there was a refusal to release them was to freeze Iranian assets in American banks. Now, we're not talking about a little bit of money here. We're talking about twelve billion dollars. Okay. Uh, that Iran could not access because of the hostage crisis. Okay? And, of course, there was also an embargo on especially spare parts for American-made weapons in Iran. And Iran's, the bulk of its weaponry was purchased from the United States. Okay? Now, Israel was brought in because it had stores of American-made equipment that could be secretly funneled to Iran, so there would be no direct transfer of arms from the U.S. <laughs> To the, uh, uh, to the Iranian government, okay? And Iran and Israel had a common enemy, which was Iraq, okay? And so it sounds very strange to us now, I mean, the Israelis wanted to give arms to Iran, indeed, they did, okay? And at the time, they wanted to, to do this because they wanted to neutralize the threat that they saw from Iraq, okay? Casey promised a better deal for Iran if it waited to release the hostages until after the election. Now, what was that better deal? Okay. Well, it did include unfreezing uh, Iran's assets in U.S. banks, but it also included not just uh, a few spare parts, okay, but ongoing shipments of arms to Iran because by the time the election took place, the Iran-Iraq war had begun. And Iran was desperate for arms. Okay, uh, the the notion that Carter would have, if re-elected, would have been willing to give arms to Iran was almost too remote to be considered. But Reagan was, well, or Reagan's campaign manager was cutting a deal here that if the Iranians helped Reagan get elected, that they could count on not just a few shipments of arms, but Israel as a source for American arms uh, well through 1981, okay? And in fact, actually, arms shipments began even before uh, the election took place, a kind of, you know, earnest of what was going to come, right? Okay, now, let me try uh, to wrap up very quickly um, and suggest what's significant about all this, okay? I, I can sort of hear some of my, uh, you know, perhaps colleagues, perhaps students, being cynical and saying, well, it doesn't this happen all the time? Is this just pop?
politics. You know, it's a dirty business, okay? And I want to say emphatically, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, the acts of the Reagan campaign undermine the fundamental democratic ideal without which a pluralistic political system cannot function, i.e. the ideal of a loyal opposition. Now, I've often heard that term bandied about, and I've often wondered what exactly what it's meant. Well, here's a sort of counterexample to demonstrate what it means, okay? Uh, in this case, they were a disloyal opposition, interfering with the foreign policy of the Carter administration in its efforts to win the release of the hostages in Iran. In other words, Iran, I mean, uh, Carter was also dealing uh, or negotiating secretly with Iran to try and get the hostages released, right? But it was being undermined by a better deal that was being offered by uh, the uh, other presidential candidate, right? Uh, and also, I think you could argue, endangered the lives of the hostages, the 52 Americans who were serving their country in Tehran, since it was impossible to foresee what would happen to them if their captivity were to be prolonged. And in 1980, there were wild uh, you know, ideas being uh, rooted in uh, Tehran, but these hostages shouldn't be released, they should be put on trial. And some of them may, may be executed, right? Uh, so when Casey was cutting his deal, uh, he may have wanted, of course, them to be released, but he had no assurance that Iran would follow through with such a promise, okay? Uh, and I have a few reflections on the role of history and historians in the life of the story. Um, one task I think we have is to set the record straight. Uh, in this case, revision, uh, of the period calls into question the legitimacy of Reagan's victory over Carter in 1980. Right? Uh, should also cause us to revise assessments of Carter's handling of the crisis because he was in competition with a with a Reagan campaign which was basically operating a different foreign policy. Right? Uh, and maybe some other reflections too. It puts the Reagan presidency in a different light because one of the well, actually, the major scandal of the Reagan presidency was the Iran-Contra affair, right? Which, it seems, took place mostly in 1985, 86, and 87. It's an extremely complex set of events, so I won't try to explain it here, right? But, basically, the dealings with Iran, the secret dealings with Iran through Israel, uh, don't anymore look like an anomaly. They look like a continuation of Reagan's willingness to promise benefits for the government of Iran in order to help solve one of its problems. And, and in the 1980s, mid-1980s, it was help, Iran's help in getting hostages in Lebanon released. Okay? It also makes things, I mean, it leaves a very bitter taste in your mouth. I mean, Reagan was, uh, in a sense, capitalizing on Carter's inability to release hostages, and then found himself in exactly the same position, but this time uh, in Lebanon, right? Uh, that is, Reagan was willing to swap arms for hostages, just as he had done in 1980 and 81, right? Uh, and it was revealed that this actually happened, and Reagan had to go on uh, national television and admit that this is what happened, right? Okay, uh, final thoughts. Gary Sick. Uh, I think uh, has done a tremendous job of, I mean, it's really, it's like a spy novel, by the way, if you're ever interested in, in thinking about it, it's really, uh, it carries you along. Uh, showing the importance of corroboration in writing of history, and Six uh, asked, you know, he talked to a lot of different people, uh, took evidence from a great many different places in order to build his case uh, for this uh, October surprise, the October surprise in this case was actually pulled off by the Reagan campaign rather than by Carter, right? Uh, it demonstrates the readiness of Israel uh, to interfere in U.S. domestic politics to gain an advantage. And uh, we could talk about this further, but I've already tried to suggest why Israel would want to help Iran in this particular case. And it also shows that Iranians who alleged uh, that a faction within Iran's leadership was negotiating with Iran, the Reagan campaign were right. Again, uh, uh, Gary Sick deserves credit for actually looking very carefully at what Iranians were saying to other Iranians in 1980 and providing evidence that the foreign minister of Iran, Sadeh uh, Fuktasadeh, was, uh, was saying out loud 
hey, you know, there are Iranians who are negotiating with the Reagan campaign in order to prolong this crisis, right? Uh, now, he was, he happened to belong to a faction that wanted to resolve the crisis because they saw it as damaging to their country, right? But there were others who wanted to prolong it and were willing to do so, again, because of the promise of a better deal for Reagan. Okay. Um, all right. Where does this leave us? Well, Shakespeare's a good place to end. Okay. You know the story of Macbeth? Macbeth was ambitious for power, right? And I love this line from Banquo, and I think it feels, it, it's a great way to sort of characterize what happened in the United States in 1980. Uh, thou hast it now, King Connor Thomas Hall, as the weird women promised, and I fear thou playedst most foul for it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Thank you very much. Are there questions uh, or, or comments uh, from the audience? Yes. Um, we're recording for uh, YouTube. Do, do we need the microphone? Uh, it's okay. Go, go ahead, please. Okay. The first one is. Um, for, um, when you were saying that um, that uh, um, they were making a deal on Khomeini with the Reagan, I'm just curious because um, wouldn't that put uh, Khomeini at a disadvantage because Reagan is uh, is more of a conservative mm -hmm. leader than um, than Carter, mm -hmm. and and also um, from what I've read on uh, Reagan that he's he's slightly more Islamophobic mm -hmm. and. Khomeini was about, um, you know, he was, he was more uh, Islamic, so would yeah. that put him at a disadvantage for Khomeini? It, it, it's, a, it's a logical question to ask, yeah. you know, how in the world would Khomeini, you know, want Reagan with the power rather than uh, Carter? I mean, you know, when, when you would actually, I mean, some, some of the hostages themselves said to their captors, Hey, if Reagan comes into power and you haven't released us, you know, he's going to drop a bomb on the Iran, right? Something like that. Um, first of all, it's, um, it's very difficult for us to know at this distance how much Khomeini knew about these negotiations and how much Reagan knew about what his campaign manager was doing. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, I think that's important to bear in mind that these. You know, a lot of these operations may have been taking place below the consciousness of the of the ostensible leaders, you know, on both sides. Um, although it does seem to me that, that Khomeini must have been insulted at some point uh, by these people. Or were they just counting on the fact that Khomeini was so angry with the partner and so much wanted to humiliate? That they wouldn't have to really convince him, you know, to, to wait to release the And so he basically wasn't very like far sighted of the media? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, the well I mean, and, and add to all of this, right, that the the, the channel for these arms was Israel. Okay. Yes. Now, now what we actually know, and, and uh, as Sid lays it out here, is that while the Iranian government is denouncing Israel, okay, and uh, you know, death to Israel, death to America, etc., is being chanted, you know, every day on the streets of Tehran. That there are representatives from the Islamic Republic of Iran who are visiting Israel in order to work out the details of this arms transfer. Okay, uh, did Khomeini again? Did Khomeini know? I don't know. Okay, but you know. Iran uh, saw, and, and this is also a very important part of Sikh's argument, is that the Iranians were aware that in, in 1980 that they were probably going to face a war with Iraq. Okay? That was building already in the spring. So the pressure on them to get arms was, was big. Okay? Now again, that sort of creates a paradox. If they, if they made a deal with the uh, Carter administration. Carter would have un unfrozen these assets, although maybe not right away. Okay, and there were some arms 
that Iran had already purchased that were in the pipeline that stopped okay, when the hostages were, hostages were seized. Okay. But Sikh's argument is that the Iranians who made this deal right, did foresee that, yes, we might get our money back, you know, and we might get some arms, okay? But if we're gonna have a war with Iraq, we need a lot of arms, okay? And we need a reliable supply of American spare parts. And he believes that that was the key thing that made him could offer that Carter was not. Can I just uh, quickly mention, uh, by the way, some of you students uh, who are here and want to get, have your presence noted, there's a, a sign-up sheet uh, over there with uh, Yasmin. Uh, yeah, the sign. Frank, go ahead. Already signed. Oh, okay. No, no, I mean, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so didn't uh, Reagan support Iraq in the war? Sorry, uh, didn't Reagan support or support Iraq? Well, uh, America supported both sides, actually. Okay. Publicly, well, actually, uh, publicly at first, the United States was neutral. Okay. Uh, then the United States did start to supply intelligence to Iraq, and ultimately, by the end of the war, more than just intelligence, some some significant quantities of equipment went to Iraq. Okay. But secretly, the United States was shipping arms to Iran, and there's this. It's very clear. Using, using Israel as the conduit. Okay. Uh, one thing I need to add here is that another reason, okay, I mean, uh, I suggested that Israel was willing to help Iran because of their common enemy. Okay. And that's true. That was the, certainly the, the, the biggest motivation for Israel participating in this. But there was this other curious thing that brought the, the Iran and Israel together, and that is that they both had weapon systems that were produced in the United States, okay? So Israel had vast quantities of weaponry and spare parts that it could share with Iran. So it was, in a way, it was, and it was also very good at covert operations. So it is the ideal sort of partner to carry out this, this whole, uh, you know, uh, scandalous action, yeah. okay? I wonder if you're in a time where, where today's young Communist uh, representatives were negotiating about the uh, situation during it or before it. Was there any negotiations uh, of the Shah's political party and Carter at the same time? Because the Shah's political party must have also foreseen the war between them and Iraq happening. So didn't they think that they must do a similar situation regarding the regarding the arms situation or the hostage situation? I'm not sure I fully understand. You're suggesting that the Shaw, I'm, I'm not sure how the Shaw comes into this. He's gone by January of 1979. Yeah, I understand, but yeah. wasn't there any supporters of the South Korean party? Oh, there were, there were. And in fact, they almost carried out the coup against uh, the, the new Khomeini government in, uh, in the summer of 19, within 1979. Yeah, yeah, there was, there were, there were remnants. Um, and that's also part of what's going on with the takeover of the American embassy. Okay, if for for Khomeini, this takeover of the embassy was a step towards purging Iran of technocratic groups that wanted to run the government and wanted to have friendly relations with the United States. He wanted to pursue a much more ideological agenda. And so his approval of the takeover of the embassy and the prolongation of the hostage crisis actually, uh, you know, sort of reinforced the more radical elements and the more and the elements that supported him and the clergy vis-a-vis -vis these other groups. Right? And the, the hostages, some hostages themselves, recognized, and they said this on in interviews and such, that. Uh, they were caught in, a, in an internal struggle within Iran, and they became pawns, you know, in a sense, to allow the Khomeini and the clergy to take power vis-a-vis -vis other groups, okay? I, I hope that sort of explains what, what happened, yeah. Yes? Um, I have a question, I wonder how is this whole crisis going to raise 
I was in commemorating. Well, it's commemorated by the fact that the United States still have no diplomatic relations with Iran. Forty years after this happened. <laughs> commemorated? I don't know. I, I can't think of a particular, you know, event in the United States that commemorates this. You know, most for most people it's sort of fate to remember. Well, I mean, it is. It's the reason that the United States still has no relations with Iran. That's not the only reason, but certainly, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's. You know, well, I, I mean, there are other, there are, there are other reasons, but this, this, the memory of what happened here is, uh, is, is kind of you know, carried into these other, you know, the dealings with Iran for other reasons. So, yeah. But the Reagan campaign did constitute treason. Were there was, was there, there was a Reagan campaign? Yeah, was yes. Reagan is, is that I mean yeah. the penalty for treason is execution. Yeah, it's not right. Right. Yeah. And I'm recalling the Nixon campaign interviews with the Fox and the Vietnam War. That's right. Um, That's right. So uh, were there any consequences for any of the I don't think I can't think of any. Um, no. Well, this is why it was investigated by the Congress, and the congressional investigation uh, did not uh, end with you know any indictments or uh, yeah any further legal uh, you know sort of trouble for those who were involved. I, I agree with you, and other people have argued this as well. That this was a treasonable offense what they did. Um, I think, oh, it was suggested, and I can't remember exactly where I read this, that it may, it may not, that the, the Congress may have hesitated to, uh, you know, really aggressively pursue this investigation further. Partly because, you know, the, uh, there were memories of what, what happened to the U.S. during Waterloo, right? And there was such a deep sort of distrust of government, I, uh, after the uh, Watergate affair, it may be that the, the Congress actually wanted to, uh, you know, prevent uh, a an exposure of the magnitude that you're suggesting. You know, so I, I don't know if that's the reason that it happened, but uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think what was done was, uh, you know, arguably a uh, treason. Yeah. 
Well, the, um, on, on OPEC, that, it brings to mind that, that in uh, 1977, uh, the, uh, the U.S. was, was very concerned, uh, 76 and 77, about um, rising oil prices. And it was having a big impact on the U.S. economy and actually the world economy. Um, and at that point in time, the show, as I said, was still very aggressive on, on prices. And it seems as though the U.S. kind of shifted its, uh, uh, you know, it, its policy of depending on the show in the direction of depending more on Saudi Arabia. Okay? Um, and uh, it, it, so it's very interesting. And it was, because uh, Saudi Arabia was much more modern. Prices than, than, than the Shaw was. Okay. So, uh, and of course, the United States had already had close relations with the Saudis. Okay. But at that point in time, it seems as though in the arguments within OPEC, uh, the U.S. pushed the Saudis towards even more moderation in order to sort of undermine the, again, the big increases that the Shaw wanted. And that's what led then to the drop in oil prices and the uh, and the Shoah getting very worried, you know, cutting some uh, programs within Iran. There, there was increased unemployment in Iran, and that contributed then to unrest in Iran. Now, the, the first part of your question, remind me. Just first. in terms of the, the recent New York Times mm -hmm. article, which talked about how somebody else yeah. discussed. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Was okay. there something new there? Um, what was new? Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and SICK actually has been interviewed, so I didn't show you this, but. Easily get this on YouTube. Just type in "sick" and interviews about uh, you know the October surprise. Um, you know, "sick" I think basically already made a very convincing case in his book back in 1991 that this this happened. You know, what and what the uh, congressional uh, investigation said. You know, they, they said all of that's there, but there's sort of no smoking gun. We don't have a testimony of somebody who was directly involved. Okay. Um, now, what, what was added by the New York Times right, was an interview with a guy named Ben Barnes, who had traveled with John Connolly, who was working for the Reagan campaign in late July of 1980. Okay. And uh, Barnes said, I didn't know what book. He doesn't want to go, he doesn't want to be indicted. He says, I didn't know like, like, what the blood broker you're doing. Okay. But Connolly, again, Connolly's not he's not Casey, he's not a campaign manager, but he's still he's a big name. And he had actually run for president as well. He was a big name in Texas politics and uh, and an important uh, you know promoter of Reagan candidacy. And he was looking forward to being Secretary of State or uh, Defense or something. Anyway, um, Connolly went to the Middle East, he visited Egypt and Israel and Jordan and Syria, Saudi Arabia. Anyway, he, he visited all of these uh, capitals in, in the uh, Middle East. And uh, Barnes said uh, what he was doing in each place, besides, of course, you know, some flat handy, was uh, telling the uh, Arabs, get a message, send a message to Iran that they're going to get a better deal if Reagan's president, okay? Now, the, the, this particular uh, you know, uh, trip to the Middle East started on the 18th of July. The reason that's important is that the Republican National Convention ended on the 17th of July, okay? So it seems logical. Okay, and so Barnes says this is what Connolly was doing. He was getting, trying to send a message to the Iranians that they're going to get this better deal with Reagan. Okay, if they wait to uh, you know release the hostages. Now we know actually that at the end of July, uh, Casey was in Madrid meeting with an Iranian, you know, who he was trying to convince of this same thing. So what seems to have been happening in the last latter half of July, after the Republican Convention was over, right, and, and Reagan had been uh, nominated, uh, was that uh, the Reagan campaign, probably, you know, all of this was under Casey's, you know, uh, direction, 
was trying various channels, trying out various channels in order to get this message to the Iranians. And he kind of ends them at the end of July with this, uh, the beginnings of the deal. They didn't make a deal right away. In fact, they didn't really close the deal until October. But the beginnings of, this, this, of these discussions with the Iranians comes when Casey goes to Madrid and, uh, and has these talks. Uh, and it just continues from there. Thank you very much, Mike. As somebody who grew up uh, during this time period, I remember that nightly Walter Cronkite signing off saying, and it's the 351st day of, 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 of uh, captivity for the Americans here on every single night. And I think it's hard to overestimate the effect of that. And then the Desert One fiasco, mm -hmm. where there was a collision of helicopters and a forward refueling mm -hmm. point when they tried to send him a mission to rescue the hostages. So, um, yeah, it was hard to feel good about the, the actions of the Carter administration at that time. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. We went just a, a few minutes over, but we like to try to start on time, end on time. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Professor Reimer's still here if you have other questions. But uh, once again, thank you for coming. One, one last thing. Uh, round of applause. Thank you very much. We have more Katsari events coming later this semester, so stay tuned. <laughs>